Thank you. So thank you for your introduction and the invitation to join you today. So the title I was given for um, my talk today was Why's, How's and Mutations, the Genetics of Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy. So it's quite a big and not the easiest topic for first thing on a Friday morning. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of an introduction to genetics and some of the key concepts that are going to come up later um, in the talk. I then move on to the why. So why does someone have Duchenne muscular dystrophy? Um, I'm then going to swap it round a bit and talk next about the mutations, or what I'll refer to as variants, so the types of gene changes that can cause Duchenne. And then how. So how do we actually test for these gene changes in the lab? So just to start, um, a definition of genetics, the study of how certain characteristics or traits can be inherited. So it's genes that pass on this information from one generation to the next. Genes are the instruction manuals um, that tell the body how to produce the proteins in the cells. Genes are made of uh, the genetic material deoxyribonucleic acid, that's better known as DNA, and is comprised of four different bases represented by the letters A, T, G, and C. There are about 20,000 genes in the human genome, and this is equivalent to about three billion letters of uh, DNA in each copy. And you have copies in virtually every single cell of your body. So I find it quite difficult to imagine how big a number three billion is. But if you said one letter of your DNA every second, 24 hours a day, it would actually take you 100 years to recite your entire genome. So that gives you a bit of perspective on how much DNA there is in every single cell. So because there's lots of genetic material, it needs to be packaged and organized. And it's organized into chromosomes. So you can think of chromosomes a bit like a bookshelf or a filing cabinet where you can find the different sets of instructions. So humans have 46 chromosomes organized into 23 pairs. So you have 22 pairs that are organized, uh, ordered by size. So these are called your autosomes. And then you have a pair of sex chromosomes. So a genetic female has two X chromosomes, and a genetic male has one X and one Y. So you get one set of each chromosomes from each of your parents. So you get 23 from your mother, including one of your mother's two X chromosomes, and 23 from your father. So females um, inherit their father's X chromosome, and males inherit their father's Y chromosome. And this is important um, in the context of Duchenne because it's the X chromosome where the gene for Duchenne is located. So, as I said, the genes provide the instructions for making the protein, so they encode protein. But actually, genes only account for about 2% of DNA in the genome. All the genes are present in all the different cells, but not all the genes are required in each cell or all of the time. Genes are broken down into coding regions, which are um, called exons, so they're shown see the laser here, in the blue rectangles, and they're separated by non-coding regions called introns, which are these orange bars in between. So the um, exons are made up of DNA, and they're translated into proteins um, in sort of three-letter words. So three letters of DNA um, determines which protein uh, residue is next in the sequence. So in this example here, the first three letters, AAG, encodes uh, the prote uh, protein residue lysine. Now, if you add in or take away a number of um, letters of DNA that isn't divisible by three. So in this example, I've added in an A and a T shown in red here. Not only do you change this word from TGG to TAT, changing the protein residue from tryptophan to tyrosine, because you've added in um, some extra letters, it actually shifts the reading frame 
So the threes are all moved along. So you get lots of different um, protein residues encoded from what it should be. You occasionally get one that's the same, but the majority of them will be completely different. And ultimately, you create a signal that tells the protein to stop. So if you change the number of letters um, by a number that's not divisible by three, this disrupts the reading frame, is what we call a frame shift. So you get the wrong residues in the protein sequence and you generate a premature stop signal. I now move on to the whys. So I'm sure you all know why I'm here talking about genetics. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a genetic disorder. Why does Duchenne predominantly affect boys? Well, it's an X-linked recessive disorder. So the X-linked um, means it's caused by a gene called dystrophin, which is located on the X chromosome. Recessive means a trait where um, it's only expressed if there is no wild type or no functional copy of the gene. In boys, they have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. As they only have one X chromosome, they only have one copy of the DMD gene. And therefore, if there's a variant on that which makes that copy non-functional, they are um, affected with Duchenne. Why aren't all male relatives in a family necessarily affected with Duchenne. So on this example pedigree here, males are shown by squares and females by circles. So the colored in squares are those affected with Duchenne and the uh, dots within the circles show Duchenne carrier females. If we look at this bit of the family down here, you can see that this lady has one son with Duchenne, but two unaffected boys as well. So each child only inherits one of the mother's two X chromosomes. And there's a, so there's a 50-50 chance of each time um, she has a child of passing on a copy with the variant. Now this is an independent event. If you've had one child with Duchenne, it doesn't mean that your next child won't have Duchenne and vice versa. Each are independent of each other. Another reason why all males may not be affected um, is that it, it may be that an, a variant has arisen in that person or more likely in the egg um, that was fertilized and developed into that person. Um, in which case, um, the mother is not, if you tested her blood, she would not be a carrier as such, but there is the possibility that a subset of her egg cells do contain the variant, so there is still a, a risk of having more than one child with Duchenne. Uh, I said it predominantly affects males, but why are some girls affected with Duchenne? Well, there are several reasons why this could happen. Um, it could be down to a chromosomal disorder. So it may be that um, there's a difference in the number of sex chromosomes. So in Turner syndrome, um, people only have 45 chromosomes instead of 46. So they only have one X chromosome. And if that one X chromosome had a Duchenne variant, then the person would be affected. Um, it may be a translocation, so that's a swapping of a bit of the X chromosome with one of the autosomes. It may be due to X inactivation, which I think the next speaker is going to um, cover more in her talk. And then it could be that actually both copies of the X chromosome have a DMD causing variant. So this might be that they've inherited one variant from the mother and that there's a new variant on the other copy. So why does a change in the DMD gene affect the muscles? Well, the dystrophin gene encodes a protein that's also called dystrophin. So this is a protein that is expressed primarily in muscles. So it's shown here on this diagram as this purple chain here. And it links the actin cytoskeleton with this complex of proteins in the muscle cell membrane that link to the extracellular matrix. So this 
linking of these components is important for protecting muscle cells from damage as the muscles contract and relax. Um, variants in the dystrophin gene that cause Duchenne muscular dystrophy cause a lo loss of functional protein. Um, so muscle cells that lack functional dystrophin protein are more sensitive to damage and therefore um, results in the progressive muscle degeneration. The dystrophin gene, um, its claim to fame is it's the largest known human gene, but it's not actually the largest protein. It has 79 exons, and variants that cause DMD can be found virtually anywhere across this gene. So moving on to the types of variants that cause Duchenne. So as I said, there are variants that result in the absence of a functional dystrophin protein. These are either large changes involving one or more whole exon. So this might be a deletion or a duplication of exons. Or small changes. So um, a single or a small number of DNA bases. So this could be a deletion, a duplication, or insertion of extra or, um, DNA bases. Or a change of one letter for a different one. So looking at the deletion or duplication of exons. So I showed you this diagram earlier of the exons separated by introns. Um, and when uh, the protein is translated, those exons are spliced together and you read through all the uh, protein coding regions. Um, so I've shown it here as rectangles, but it doesn't mean um, that each exon encodes a set number of um, protein residues. So not all of the three letters may be in one exon. They may be spanning across um, adjacent exons. So perhaps it's better represented by this sort of different shape where um, this sort of pointy end showing that uh, the first, say, two letters of a um, codon are in one exon, and the third letter will be in the next. So that when they join together, you're still able to read through. However, if you um, delete some of these exons, and they're exons that are out of frame, so the number of bases in there is not divisible by three, when you um, splice them together, not only have you lost the material from these two exons, you've also disrupted this reading frame, so you're not able to read through properly. And the same is true of a duplication. So you might um, duplicate this exon, so you've got two copies of this exon, and when you splice them together, you've got extra material from this extra copy of the exon, but again, the reading frame is disrupted. So deletions and duplications of whole exons remove or insert, so resulting loss or extra protein instructions. If um, the exons that are deleted or duplicated don't include a, uh, the number of DNA letters that's a multiple of three, they will be out of frame. So this means that the instructions after the deletion or insertion don't make sense, and it's likely to create an early stop instruction to terminate the protein, and you don't get functional protein produced. Um, sequence variants, so these are the changes to one or more of the DNA letters. So this is either a substitution, so you've got the same number of letters, but one of the or more of the letters has changed. So in Duchenne, these are often either a splice site mutation or what's called a nonsense mutation, and we'll talk about these in a bit more detail in a second. Or the other type of change is a frame shift variant. So again, one of these changes in the number of letters, which isn't divisible by three. So this might be a deletion of a letter or letters, duplication or insertion, or a combination of the two, where you delete some letters and insert some others, but again, a different, a different number, which isn't divisible by three. 
So this, an example of a splice site mutation. So again, using this blue shape here as your exon, followed by your intron in orange. And so um, here you can see the last base of the exon is this C here. Um, so this is the sequence. So this is a control sequence, so your reference, and this is a Duchenne patient. And see here that the first base of this intron should be a G, but in this patient, it's an A. So this change of letter means that it's no longer recognized um, as a splice site. So you don't get the joining together properly of these exons. And so the exon is likely to be skipped or missed out. So again, you lose the region that's encoded by that exon. And if it is out of frame, it then may end up in a frame shift. Um, so the other type of substitution in Duchenne is a nonsense variant. So I've put on here marking out the three letter codons. Um, and so again, you've got your reference sequence on the top and your patient underneath. And so you've got this codon here, which is TTG, which encodes a leucine uh, residue. However, in the patient, this T has changed to an A, so the codon changed to TAG, which tells the protein to stop. So it creates an early stop signal. So it terminates the protein sequence, and so you lose the remainder of the protein, and you don't get a functional copy. Now, nonsense mutations um, are important because these are the mutations that can be amenable to drugs such as translana uh, that allow read through of the premature stop codon. Frame shift variants are the ones that change the number. Um, so we've got two examples here. Again, you've got your reference on the top and the patient on the bottom. Um, in this first example, let me get the slide. You can see here, we've deleted this C. So there should be CCG here, and it just goes CG. So you're missing a C here. So that would um, mean that there's a shift in the region frame. And similarly, in this example here, in the control, there's one, two, three, four, five, six A's. And in the patient, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven A's. So you've got an extra A inserted here. So you have a change in the number of letters, either by a deletion, a duplication, an insertion, or a combination of these that's not divisible by three. So from that point on, any change, the change in the protein sequence um, is not correct and will normally lead to an early stop signal and no functional protein. Although these variants also cause an early stop frame, um, an early stop signal, frame shift variants are not amenable um, to the drugs that read through uh, premature stop codons, as the remainder of the protein sequence will still be incorrect and disrupted. So how do we um, test for these changes in the lab? If it's a new case, we don't know what change we're looking for. Uh, luckily, with Duchenne, we know that it is only variants in the dystrophin gene that cause DMD, so we only need to look in this gene. If someone has a family history and there's a known DMD variant, then we can test for that specifically. But if the variant has not already been found in the family and it's not possible to test the original family member, then we uh, would need to look in the closest uh, relative to that affected person to have the highest chance of being able to find the variant in the family. Because we know that um, about 75% of Duchenne cases have a deletion or duplication involving one or more of the exons, we can start by looking um, for those, that type of mutation. And we do that using a technique called multiplex ligation dependent probe amplification or MLPA. 
So this is a diagram or diagrams that I've taken from the MRC Holland website, um, and they're the company that make the MLPA kits for uh, Duchenne. So MLPA uses pairs of pro probes that are designed to hybridize to specific sequences. So in DMD, these will be to the 79 exons of the DMD gene, um, plus to control areas in different genes on different chromosomes. Because there are so many in DMD, this actually has to be split across two kits. So about half of the exons are in one kit and half in the other. Um, so these probes ligate, um, bind specifically to these regions, and only if they bind next to each other will they ligate together. So this makes them highly specific. They, the probes are designed with these um, tags on the end, which means they can be amplified with a single set of PCR primers. So this means that they're all amplified together. Um, and they're designed to be of different lengths so that we can separate them out based on their size. So we do this and we run them out. And so each of these blue peaks here is one of the probes. And you probably won't be able to see, but they're all then labeled with what probes they are. So this is a reference sample. And we can then compare the heights of these probes um, for the different DMD exons to the reference probes within the sample and then compare patient samples to control samples to look at the different ratios, which are then shown in this box plot down here. So um, a normal dosage, or so a normal number of um, copies of the exon will be shown in the middle here between these blue and red lines. So here is a male with Duchenne. So these red arrows show where there should be blue peaks, but they're absent because there are no copies of those exons. So there's no probes present. And when you do the maths comparing those probes, they drop right out and they're down here on the bottom. Um, in a female, you do get some uh, probe, but it's about half for is about half the height when the exon's deleted, so shown here on these two arrows. And then when you do the maths, they drop below this red line and are about half the size that they should be. And then conversely, uh, for a duplication, I didn't think I needed red arrows here because they stick out like a sore thumb. Um, you get them as twice the height because you've got the extra copy. And when you do the maths, they sit up above this blue line here. So as well as being able to detect the variant in the family, if we know that um, the variant in the family is a deletion or a duplication of an exon, we can use this same methodology to test the family members. Um, depending on what exons are involved, it might be that we only need to use one of the two kits when we're testing family members. Uh, looking for sequence variants, we need to actually sequence the whole gene because we don't know where it could be. Um, historically, the size of the DMD gene, the 79 exons, made this quite challenging and very um, costly and labor intensive. Uh, luckily, new technologies came online in about 2010. Um, so this is referred to as next generation sequencing, which made it possible to sequence millions of fragments in, in a massively parallel fashion, so at the same time, and this increased the speed, reduced the cost, and meant that we could get results more quickly. So uh, just quickly, the outline of um, NGS, the NGS process is to fragment your genomic DNA into lots of bits, enrich for the bits that you're interested in, um, add adapters that are specific for your technology that you're using, sequence all of those fragments at once, and then line them back up against your reference sequence so you can then look for differences. So when we do this, um, we sequence in both directions. So they're shown, all of the reads here are shown by these blocks. So the sort of purpley blue are in one direction and the green are in the opposite direction. And they all overlie each other. So 
So they're all random fragments that have been sequenced and then aligned back to this region of the genome. So this is an exon here shown in gray with the introns either side in yellow. Now you can see that the software has highlighted a difference. And if we zoom in there, so this is the reference sequence at the top. Um, you can see that there's two colors here, and it's showing a difference um, so that these Ts are not what should be in the reference sequence, but in about half of the, the reads in this patient, they have a T here. So this is a female patient or a female sample. Um, and although the software is only showing, highlighting the difference here, actually what is there, this is the full sequence that's read out. It's just highlighted to make it easier for us to see because as you can see, <laughs> if you were looking at that, you'd find it difficult to spot. So once a variant has been identified um, in a patient and, or is known in the family, we can then use the more traditional Sanger sequencing method that's targeted just to that region or exon to test family members. So this is um, more like the sequencing I showed earlier to explain the variants. Um, so again, when we do Sanger sequencing, we sequence both strands, so in two directions. So at the top, you've got in the forward direction, and the bottom is the reverse. So again, you've got your reference sequence at the top, your patient sample in the middle, and that's a comparison between the two, and the opposite on the bottom. So your control on the bottom, your patient, and the comparison between the two. Um, and, okay, yeah. Um, and so here you can see there's um, a change in this male patient and in his female relative, you can see the change is there, but they have both copies. So there's an A and a G at that position. We can also offer prenatal diagnosis for DMD. So this is usually only offered in male pregnancies um, where the mum is confirmed to be a carrier or if she's not a carrier um, in her blood but she has a previous child with uh, DMD so is at risk of being um, a germline mosaic so having uh, other eggs with the variant. So traditionally this has been, it, been an invasive test so either a sample from the placenta taken at 10 to 12 weeks gestation or amniotic fluid taken at uh, 15 to 18 weeks gestation. And we would directly test for the familial mutation using the methods that I've shown. However, there's now the opportunity for non-invasive prenatal diagnosis. So this is uh, utilizing cell-free fetal DNA, which is present in the mum's circulating blood. Um, so about seven to nine weeks gestation, cell-free fetal DNA makes up about 10% of the circulating um, DNA in the mother's plasma. So this can be um, tested for using a blood sample from the mother. So it's a specific blood sample taken in a special tube called a streck tube, which stabilizes the cell-free DNA. And um, they don't actually test directly for the familial mutation. They do an indirect test um, which works out which of the um, chromosomes the um, baby has inherited, whether it's the high risk or the low risk um, chromosome. So NIPD might not be uh, applicable to multiple pregnancies, so twins or triplets, etc. cetera. Um, and if mum is not a carrier in her blood, but has um, a germ germline mosaicism risk, um, if the NIPD indicates that the high-risk um, X chromosome has been inherited by the baby, they might need to do a follow-up um, invasive test to determine whether it actually has the variant um, on that copy or not. So just to summarize, because there was a lot of information there, um, I've been through some of the key genetic concepts um, related to DMD. So we've talked about the genetic basis of Duchenne, uh, the types of gene change, and then how we can test for them in the lab. So thank you for listening, and I'd just like to acknowledge my colleagues in the Oxford Genetics Lab, Carl Fratter, Jesse Hayesmore, and Kate Thompson, and my colleagues at the West Midlands Regional Genetics Lab that offer the NIPD test for our region. Thank you.